Good evening and thank you for all of your birthday wishes both here in the chat and also over Facebook and those of you that have emailed the office. I, I am honored, gratified by all of your wishes that are given, I believe, with the sincere blessing of the Lord. I am 73 today, and I think somebody should write a book to tell us what 73 is supposed to feel like, because I don't feel any different to I did 40 years ago. Um, and I, I give praise to God, I really do, that I, I take no prescription drugs, nor any over-the-counter drugs come to that, and haven't done so for a good 40 years. And so I'm in great health, rejoicing in the Lord, and thanking the Lord that I have you as my friends. Okay, I want to share with you tonight something that if you've been around me for a while you've heard me talk about this before it's one of those scriptures that came to me decades ago and it has stayed with me but i want to speak about it in the theme that we started last week which was asking the question who are you and to recognize that how we see ourselves in relationship to the Lord, how we see ourselves in Christ determines our action and our behavior. And it has been the tragedy of many believers that they have begun with behavior to try and somehow elevate themselves in terms of who they are in Christ. No, we begin with who you are. And out of that flows our behaviors and all of our experience of, of him and so the the text is in numbers in chapter 13 and I'm just going to read bits and pieces of it here um, the 12 scouts sometimes they're called spies but they were scouting out the land of Canaan Israel was camped on the edge of Canaan at a place called Kadesh Barnea and they were spreading out their camp into the desert and the people selected 12 of them 12 scouts they are sent into the land of Canaan so that they could spy it out and have a strategy of how they're going to take what the Lord has given to them this land and so finally after six weeks they return from their scouting expedition verse 25 and then in verse 26 they they come to Moses they brought with them some of the fruit of the land just to show the people the abundance of its fruitfulness and they brought these grapes from Eshkol and they were the biggest grapes the most luscious grapes you've ever seen and they're telling the people in verse 27 we went into the land where you sent us and it certainly does flow with milk and honey and this is its fruit nevertheless the great big but the people who live in the land are strong the cities are fortified and very large and moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. They were an unusually large people. Um, that they had something akin to giantism. I mean, they were physically tall, but their whole bodies were proportioned, and they were strong as they were big. And they were the descendants of Anak. And then they want on Amalek is living, and the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites, all these were tribes, vicious, uh, primitive, really, tribes that would send horror down your spine to speak the name for their cruelty and their strength. And, and as they say in that, then Caleb quieted the people because the people are beginning to respond to this negative speech and, and, and they're getting restless and anxious 
and terrified. Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, We should by all means go up and take possession of it, for we will surely overcome it. But the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are too strong for us. So they gave out to the sons of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone in spying it out is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people whom we saw in it are men of great size, as in it devours you. To go into this land is like walking into the mouth of a crocodile. And then he says, there we also saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, and we became like grasshoppers in our own sight. Get that, hear it very carefully. We became like grasshoppers in our own sight. That is, we looked at ourselves and when we looked around us, and then we looked at ourselves and we looked around us, we said, we are grasshoppers in this place. And then they go on and said, and so we were in their sight. Now, I, there's no record that the they, these people, the sons of Anak and the Amorites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, they had not had conversations with these people. But they saw themselves as grasshoppers and so determined that everybody else must be looking at them in precisely the same way. At such a statement in chapter 14, the congregation, all the Israelites, lifted up their voices. They cried. The people wept that night. The whole night is filled with their weeping. And all the sons of Israel grumbled. That's a serious word in Scripture. It means complaining. And in this place, it, it looks like it's leading to a lynch mob. They said, would that we had died in the land of Egypt. They, they love going up that way. Going back into the past and saying, wasn't it wonderful to be slaves? Why did you have to bring us here? Or would that we had died in this wilderness, anything but this. Go, if God's giving us this land, he's giving it to us to trap us like rats in a trap. We're going to go in there and we're going to die. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land so that we fall by the sword? He's bringing us here to kill us. Our wives and our little ones will become plunder. They're going to take our wives and our children into slavery. Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? Ah, oh, there's rebellion, you say. There's a lynch mob. Get rid of Moses. Get rid of Aaron. Let's go back to Egypt. And then another chap shows up. Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, who already had tried to quiet the people, they both of them had been scouts so these are two of the twelve scouts and they spoke to the congregation they said the land which we pass through to spy out is an exceeding good land and if the Lord is pleased with us then he will bring us into this land he will give it to us it's a land which flows with milk and honey do not rebel against the Lord do not fear the people of the land, they will be our prey. Their protection has been removed from them. The Lord is with us. Do not fear. Well, that, that's the story. An Old Testament story, and it is one that goes all the way through to the New Testament in terms of what happened there. And so um, it speaks about this story and when it refers to it in 1 Corinthians 10, speaks to it specifically in Hebrews chapter 4. Now, get the picture. These people, these people of Israel, they stood at the gateway to the land that had been promised to them in covenant. Um, actually, it had been promised to them for a very long time. And that promise and why Canaan and why who live there now had to go, that's another long story. Just understand it. This land 
called Canaan had been promised to Israel. In fact, as far back as Abraham and then on to Isaac and then on to Jacob and then it was carried into the land of Egypt, the promise that one day the Israelites would live in the land of Canaan. However, for 500 years now, approximately, more 450, these people had been abused as a people. Try, try and understand this. As a people, uh, a block, they had been abused, they had been rejected, for they had been slaves. 450 years they had been in Egypt and for a good part of that time they had been the slaves of the Pharaoh. Try and understand that. That's very important to this story. That they had been dishonored. They had been disrespected. Oh, that's putting it mildly. That they had been considered of no consequence. I mean, if they drop dead, just throw the dirt over them and get on with the job. They're, they're of no consequence. That they were oppressed to the max. And they were crushed under the goals and ideals of Pharaoh. And so it was imprinted into their very DNA. The way they looked at themselves. They saw themselves as victims of the Pharaoh. When they got up in the morning, it never occurred to them that life could be, would be any different to what it was yesterday as they went down to the brick fields where they made the bricks that made the great monuments. And, I mean, those monuments are still around today. Where in the British Museum in London, I've handled the actual bricks that the Israelites made in the book of Exodus. Uh, and, and so they, they made those great Egyptian monuments that are still there. Um, but, but as I say, they, they lived and they died for all those years, 500 years nearly. Okay, but things have dramatically changed. Please hear me now. You are dealing with an abused, rejected, oppressed, kicked around, counted of no consequence people who had imprinted into their very minds and where they looked at life, we are victims. We are slaves of the Pharaoh. And whatever is the Pharaoh's pleasure, that is what we do. That's why we exist. That was who they were. Then there came Moses into the court of the Pharaoh and everything began to change. There proceeded the plagues that are recorded in the book of Exodus. And as I think I've told you before, those plagues were not just willy-nilly, um, let's do this or let's do that. Every one of those plagues addressed one of the demon gods of Egypt. Everything that came crashing down in the plagues involved the certain family of gods that Egypt worshipped. And therefore, by the end of the ten plagues, the entire system of idol worship in Egypt had been destroyed. It was gone because their gods had been seen as no gods before Yahweh, the God that Moses came and spoke in his name and said, let my people go. You, you've, you've held them in slavery too long. Let them go. And they left, you know the story, left by the blood of the Passover lamb. And, and that night, the, they all move out of Egypt, an unbelievable sight. An entire section of Egypt called Goshen is evacuated as these people in their thousands upon thousands, they leave Egypt. And as they come to the edge of the wilderness, 
where, where the ro main road, uh, paved road stops. There they were greeted by the presence of God. He came to them as a cloud of shining light by day that overshadowed them, not only a pillar ahead of them, more like a, an atomic cloud that mushroomed over them so that they were protected from the sun. At night it became a blazing fire so that they were kept warm when the temperatures plummeted to zero. But that light was more than just air conditioning and heat. and It, it, it was the presence of their personal covenant God that, that led them. Then there came after that the, the Red Sea parting. And after that they, they came into the experience of hunger which was supplied by miraculous food dropped around the camp every dawn called manna. Uh, and then water came out of the rock for there was no water in that trackless blazing desert. But he supplied the water. And when they were attacked by the Amalekites, they were endued with power beyond their strength, wisdom. For remember, they were helpless slaves, and yet now they stood up against these thugs of the desert. Now, now what, what is happening here? I want you to hear me very carefully here. It's very, very important. This was a, a journey that was specified by the cloud. That is, the cloud of the presence of God. God's presence made visible to them. He deliberately led them this way. There was another way, which would have been much more direct. They could have been to the land of Canaan in a few days. But he led them in this circuitous fashion. There was a way they could have gone which did not involve the Red Sea. But he led them to the Red Sea. He led them into the dead end. He led them through the desert where they would be hungry and thirsty in order that he might give them the manna and give them the water. But what is happening here? A specific journey that, that is going to take them off track. Instead of the quick route to Canaan, they go off to Mount Sinai and even going there, as I say, they went in a circuitous fashion because they didn't have to go through the Red Sea. What he's doing, please hear me, this is a healing pathway. It's a healing journey. People like this, hear me, they, they, they've gone through generation after generation of being crushed and abused and told they are nothing, they are worthless. Beatings are part of their life. Pain and sorrow, mental abuse, physical abuse, emotional abuse, it's part of their life. They know no other. Now they are free, but you see, it's still there, etched into their innermost person. They still believe they're nothing. They still believe they're worthless. They still believe that their lot in life is to be the victim of whoever, whatever, comes into their life. And so essentially the Lord is saying, you're not ready for Canaan yet. That, that's where I'm taking you. That, that's the prize. But I'm going to take you on another trek. It's going to be a journey of healing. When you will begin to experience my presence, my love, my protection, my provision. And in that experience, you will be given a new history. You'll, you'll be given new experiences. You've only had one history, and that is of being beaten up and being made 
victim slaves. Your lives have been manipulated by cruel powers. Well, I'm going to introduce you to another way of life altogether. And it's a way of life that is very difficult to get through all of that expectancy of abuse and that placing yourself as victims. And so I'm going to lead you. And you're going to face the Red Sea. And, and you're going to feel your weakness and your helplessness and your hopelessness. And you're going to hear the old victim masters coming after you. And then I'm going to do something that is so incredible that it's going to be talked about till the end of time. It will define you as a people. I'm going to part the Red Sea and you're going to walk across the sea bed with dry feet. And when you're across, then I'll let Egypt come after you if they're stupid enough. And, and the sea will come down upon them and you'll never see your oppressors again. And so it was. Can you imagine their bug eyes? Can you imagine their open mouths as they go through the Red Sea following the cloud of glory's direction while that cloud was holding back the Egyptians? Can you imagine coming up the slope, the other side of the Red Sea, and you look back and you see the cloud is lifted now on the other side so the Egyptians can come galloping through. And then you watch as the whole lot collapses in and you are free. Can you taste the freedom? They went nuts. They danced on the shore. The whole song that they sang is in Exodus 15. Miriam, the sister of Moses, grabbed tambourines and they danced and they whirled and sang free. They had the experience of freedom. They had the experience of the Lord, their deliverer, the Lord, their savior. And they went on and they get hungry and then begins the old complaints and the Lord shows his provision in giving them manna. They never did know what it was. It was food that contained everything they would ever need. All the minerals and vitamins and proteins and carbohydrates, it was all wrapped up in this stuff. But they didn't know what it was. And so in their Hebrew language, they held it up and they said, manna, manna. You see, the word manna in Hebrew means, what on earth is it? Well, they never found out. And so it was called the what on earth is it? It was his provision. Their God was saying, I love you. Their God was saying, I'll be a father to you. I will put bread on your table and it will contain everything you need. Deuteronomy goes further and says that their shoes on their feet never wore out. Their clothes never wore out. So that in, in their clothing, in their food, there, there was the ever presence of the God who cared and the God who provided. And when they ran out of the water and, and Moses hit the rock and out of the rock came this beautiful, clear water, water in the midst of a burning desert. And it was enough for them all to drink. And it says in Corinthians, it followed them. They always had enough to drink. And the, the protection, it was as if the arms of God's love is, is just enfolding these people. His presence is with them. As I say, it overshadows them as if his arms are around them. And they have experience. Notice that. Experience after experience of that provision and that protection. So now, when they get up in the morning, their expectancy is what? is he going to do today? Until they come to Mount Sinai. And in Mount Sinai, there, there comes the great announcement. Uh, the announcement, it's in uh, Exodus in chapter 19, where the Lord gives a, what shall I say, a resume 
of his dealings with them. Um, he, he says, through Moses, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you. So he's saying, it's, you know, it all happened over a period of about nine months and now we've been so many weeks here in the wilderness together. Uh, and so now let's stop and think about this. He says, I, I, I brought you, I bore you on eagle's wings and I brought you to where we are right now. That's, have you ever seen what he's talking about here? You know, eagles, they build their nests so high on the precipice. I mean, it's a dizzy drop down the precipice and they're perched right on the top of the precipice is the eagle nest. And, and when the little babes, they, they are ready to fly, Mother Eagle knows that. And, and so first of all, she kicks all the fluff out of the nest. She had lined the nest with, with the fluff of her feathers, but now she kicks it out. And, and what's left are uh, the wood she'd made the nest with, which contains spikes and briars, and is no longer comfortable. And she puts the little ones right on the edge of the nest and he's urging them sort of, you can fly, go do it. And then she kicks them off and they go flying. Well, I, I say flying, they're really dropping like a stone down that dizzy precipice. And, and when it seems that they don't get it, she flies underneath them with her enormous wingspan and she catches them. And they go back and it happens again until they learn to fly. He, he said, I brought you on eagle's wings. I, 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 I pushed you where you'd never been before. I, I introduced you to the world of covenant love. I introduced you to the world of my care and my provision and my protection and you'd never been there before. And, and I've been teaching you to walk. I've been teaching you to trust and I've caught you and I've carried you on eagle's wings and, and I have brought you to this place. I brought you here. And then in chapter 20, which of course um, it is, we, we simply say the giving of the Ten Commandments, but do you remember the first verse? I mean, everybody talks about you know, you shall not kill, steal, and all that sort of stuff. Uh, that's there. But do you remember the first verse? I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. That is, he, he reminds, I'm not just tossing laws at you. I'm the God who loves you. I'm your deliverer. And I'm not just God. I am the Lord your God. I've given myself away to you. Oh yeah, this had been a healing journey when all the experiences that were part of their life in Egypt had now been replaced by an experience of the love of God. Get with it, guys. Get with it. Understand what's happening to you. Understand. Yes, you are weak in yourself, and that's proper. It's a proper creaturely position to be weak. But the Lord is your strength, and He has a goal. He said His goal against the goals of Pharaoh, and Pharaoh lost. Now you are experiencing his love goals and he's carrying you in his strength or you could put it this way he's introduced them to the mirror if you were with us last week you know what I mean by that he introduced them to the mirror of reality God love reality and as they're looking into the mirror which this is also new to them but they're seeing in the mirror this this God who loves them which make them 
his beloved, or he said in chapter 19 of Exodus, you're my unique people, my special people, the ones I delight in. Look in the mirror, see who he really is, see then who you are. See what I've made you to be. This, this was the message. By Exodus 24, they're still camped at Mount Sinai. But in chapter 24, the leaders of Israel, their representatives, there's a very, shall I say, mystical experience that is recorded there. And yet it smacks of an historical moment. It actually happened, they didn't dream it, that their leaders were ushered into the other half of the universe and yet there was the food and drink of humans there because they ate and they drank in the presence of God. That is, they had a covenant meal with God. God said, I am giving myself to you. I am sharing your history as you share mine and they understood that phrase more than ever that had been with them for generations already the Lord be with you the Lord is with us and at that same period of time they're given not only the book of Exodus but also the book of Leviticus took place there at Mount Sinai and in Leviticus 26 and 6, we don't have time to look at it, but in there he said that whenever you face anyone who is seeking to stop you proceeding into the love goal that God has for you, he said you will have this coming upon of strength and ability. And he said, two of you shall, shall put hundreds to flight. He said, the, your enemies will look at you and they'll see more than you and they'll be terrified of you. I will fight for you. I'm with you. And I will, I will fulfill my goals and I will do my promises to you and I'll do it in you, I'll do it through you. Only you go and be courageous. You go put your foot down and take what I'm giving to you. They went from Mount Sinai after all that time, shall I say, on a diversion, a healing diversion, when their memories of abuse have been flooded with love and care and protection. And they go now in a straight line to the border of Canaan, their immediate goal of promise. And it would become the launching pad for the divine goal. And the 12 scouts go in and they come back after six weeks with their report of terror. Why on earth a report of terror? terror. I mean, hey guys, don't you remember the plagues of Egypt? I mean, Egypt was a much more world force of power than ever these people in Canaan. These are just sort of Neanderthal brutes compared with Egypt's sophisticated power. And, and the Lord brought Egypt to its knees in nine months. What, what, what's the matter, guys? Don't you remember the Red Sea? Part in the Red Sea for you. Don't, don't you remember when the Amalekite thugs tried to destroy you on your way to Sinai and you were empowered? Don't you remember what he said at Sinai? That you were his people? That he was your God? that he would give you his empowerment to do his will? What on earth has come over you? These 12 had, well not the 12, 10 of them, had looked in the mirror, but the mirror had become all fogged up. 
at the sight of these great people, I mean great in the sense of size, and they, they were, we, we have the records, they were gigantic kinds of people. But the Hebrews were short, that didn't help matters. And, and so they, they looked up at these gigantic people, and, and of course the people had built cities and their chariots all in proportion to their size. And then of course those other fellows, the Amorites and Jebusites and Hittites, I mean they're all a very bad bunch. There, there's no question about it. But as they looked at the opposition, as they looked at these, the sons of Anak and the Jebusites and all the other rites, as they looked at them, they did not remember. I mean, th this is, I mean, you talk about amnesia. Not, not only everything that happened on the way from Egypt, but at Mount Sinai, the glory of God came to the top of Mount Sinai, and God spoke to them in Hebrew, spoke to the whole nation. They heard the voice of their God. They, they saw His presence. It was the cloud of His presence that had brought them to Kadesh Barnea. You, What's the matter with you? You're looking in a mirror and you're seeing the Jebusites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the sons of Anak, and you're defaulting to the Egypt image of who you are. You're suddenly talking about yourselves as victims you are crumbling before the first sight of opposition. I mean, there's, they're, they're saying that the very idea of possessing this land that God has given us, and incidentally, they said, it is everything God says it is. It's the most incredible land we've ever seen. But they're saying it's foolishness. It's not for us. It's not for the likes of us. We belong back in Egypt. All oh, that we oh, what a stupid idea it was to leave Egypt. That's where we belong in the slave pits. That's where that's our comfort zone. What are we doing here? Uh, trying to take on this ridiculous, impossible project. And they ended the report with. We looked at ourselves. You're looking in the wrong mirror, boys. They looked at themselves and says, We're grasshoppers. We're grasshoppers. When we look at these people, when we look at their cities, when we look at what we've got to do if we're ever going to come here, we're grasshoppers. I, I don't know. Some of you city folk, um, you, you're... You might not have too much association with grasshoppers, but um, we have lots of them here. And they're interesting little things chirping away. Um, there's something about a grasshopper. I mean, it, it, it's certainly small, and it's got no significance, you know? If, if you see a tarantula, which we've got those around here too, um, yeah, it's, it's small, I mean, in comparison to me, but it's got a lot of significance. You you take a tarantula very seriously, but a grasshopper, actually, just this afternoon, as Nancy was getting into her car, would you believe there was a grasshopper sitting on on the trunk of the car, and um, I thought it was unique that I was speaking on this tonight, and there it was, and and. You can see its eyes. They're, they're sort of big eyes, and, and it, it sits there looking as if, how on earth did I get here? You can almost hear the little thing saying, I'm awfully sorry to have interrupted you, and then, whoop, it's gone. Hops away, hops away. Little grasshoppers. Um, no significance, no consequence. Actually, 
you feel like that. You're not cute, you know. Um, insignificant insects. That's a grasshopper. A and harmless. As I say, if it was a tarantula, we, you, you know, you go on alert because it might not kill you, but it couldn't hurt you. But, but um, incidentally, there's a very big furry spider. Um, I suddenly realize you might not know what that is. Um, you see these uh, fur, furry spiders, and and you're you're not going to <clears throat> mess around. You're not going to say, "Oh, look at that cute thing." You're you're going to get rid of it. But a grasshopper, <laughs> they're harmless. And, and if you're walking along in the grass, the grasshopper had better get out of the way, otherwise it will be trodden on. And and these twelve of the ten scouts said we we looked at ourselves we look obviously in the wrong mirror they're looking at themselves and when they look in the mirror they see two bulging eyes of a grasshopper and they said that's who I am I'm a grasshopper they, they were just hopping around the land of Canaan trying to avoid being trodden on by the inhabitants and in their eyes they said, we're, we're insignificant here, we're of no consequence, uh, and, and th these people are not even afraid of us, They're, we're harmless creatures ready to be stepped on. In fact, they, they see themselves as trespassers in a land that isn't theirs. You, you see what I mean? No, no grasshopper here tries to think that it owns this land. It always gets out of my way. It always jumps and hops away with these excuses for having disturbed me. Um, they saw themselves as trespassers. But you see, God had said, I have given you the land. Their response to that was, no, not really. He hasn't given us the land. We're just looking, just looking. Don't don't get too upset with us. Do, do you hear what I'm saying? They have defaulted to the mirror of their ancestors. They've defaulted to the mirror of their past history and all of their past experiences and they've defined the situation they're in through that very, very incomplete reality. Rather than the mirror that has been given to them in no uncertain way in the last year the mirror of divine reality. Or to again remind you, they remembered what they should by now have forgotten. And they forgot what they should be remembering. And you remember the word, remember the word, remember. In the Bible it means to bring a past event into the present day, into this present moment. And do that by replaying or by doing it or by acting in the light of it. You, you bring it into the present and release its energy into this moment by acting in accord with it. Well, then you bring the plagues of Egypt into this moment. You bring the Red Sea. You bring his protection and so on. And you say, the God who delivered us from Egypt is with us. He who brought us through the Red Sea is with us. And therefore, this is his gift to us. And we shall go in his strength to take it. But they forgot. Isn't that incredible? They forgot all that God had done. And the word forget then in the scripture means to leave something in the past disconnected from the present and therefore not to do and not to act in the light of it. To leave all its revealed strength and energy just as a part of history. Interesting. Discuss it. Intellectualize. Put it back on the shelf. 
to see something that happened in the past that has no authority now in my present. I'm going to act as if it never happened. Do you see what I'm saying? They acted as if there had been no plagues, acted as if there had been no Red Sea, and they stand here as if they're just helpless humans. They forgot everything that God had said to them. They didn't take him seriously at all in this moment. They didn't see him as the one who could not lie. They denied his covenant and his covenant faithfulness. They scorned all of his covenant plans and all the goals that he had for their life and the life of the world through them. They looked in the mirror and saw the opposition and they saw themselves as insects that were just simply in the way. And from that ridiculous mirror they were looking in, the Lord seemed remote and every feeling rose in them against the possibility of it ever being true. They saw themselves. They're the joke of Canaan. Grasshoppers, for goodness sake. Grasshoppers. And they believed. They believed. To them it was so obvious. If we see ourselves as grasshoppers, then the people of Canaan see us as grasshoppers in exactly the same way. And they're laughing at us now as surely as we are trembling as we hop back to our camp. And the result of that message was the whole of Israel believed it. They all went back to the default mirror of being victims, oppressed, of insignificant, and they dissolve into weeping and despair, except for one man, Caleb. And he stood against all the other scouts, and in fact the entire multitude. And now uh, Caleb had the same evidence that the other spies had exactly the same evidence. He'd been there, he'd seen what they saw. But he took what he saw and he placed it within the Word of God. He said, what I saw was real, but I'm going to place what is real into the final reality of the covenant God who cannot lie. And he declared himself as being one with God's covenant goal. And he evaluated the situation looking in the mirror of God's covenant truth. And therefore he spoke his expectancy of his covenant God and therefore how the covenant God would use him and the whole of Israel. And he says, we are ready to act as if that is so. He declared, if you remember the reading, he, he says that the Lord is pleased. The, the, the word there means he's delighted with us. He loves us. We're a special people. And because of that, we're able to take then everything he gives to us. Nothing can stand in our way. He said, the enemy is already defeated. The Lord is with us. There's a verse in Psalm 103, and really it deserves an entire hour, but I'll throw it in here. In, in Psalm 103 it says that he, the Lord, made known his acts, A-C-T-S, his acts, his actions, to Israel. What, what does that mean? He made known his actions. Well, okay, his actions were the plagues and the Red Sea and the manna and so on. That's what he did, and he made it known to them. But the word action is used very carefully there, because an action, if that's all you saw, an act, well, then it's a random act of power. Wow, God did that. Wow, God did that. Do you say God did that? They saw the actions of God, and that was it. God did things. 
And would you believe it, what Psalm 103 is saying, it would appear they didn't see the big picture. They didn't see what God was really up to. They didn't see who this God was, who was doing this. They merely saw his actions and wowed at them. But it says, Moses, he saw the ways of God, made known his acts to Israel and his ways to Moses. Now that word ways, and that's where we could spend a lot of time, it, it, it actually means the tread of feet. Very, what shall I say, intentional tread. It, it's the tread of feet that are going somewhere and go there so often that they make a path. And so the word used there is the word for treading feet with deliberate intention. And it's also the word for the way or the pathway that is created by those treading feet. Ah, I see the difference. He made known his acts to the children of Israel. That's all they saw. He did this, he did that, he did the other. But Moses got the big picture. He saw that these acts of God were really milestones upon his deliberate journey to a goal. Do you get it? The Lord was going somewhere. He had a purpose. He had a plan, a goal and he's going there and he's surely going there he has announced his intention and nothing will stop him and along that way as milestones upon his journey and intention there are actions but they all fit together they are manifesting a God who is love and a God with love purpose that he's going to fulfill and so they're not random acts. They are acts that fit together like a jigsaw puzzle. And they are actions that make you ready for the next one because they, they fit together. And he who has begun a good work will fulfill it. And so he who did what he did will do what he will do because they're not random acts. They are acts that fit upon this treading of God toward his intention. Caleb saw that. So to him, the God who trod through Egypt, and we saw his actions and his milestones that he left behind as he did it and as he tramped through the Red Sea and left the milestone, this is what he will do to get to his end. That's the God who bring, brings us to Canaan. He said, this is, this is the prize. So, fellows, let's go in and take it because the Lord is with us. The Lord who was with us is with us and shall be with us. You know, he was so committed to that. When I, when I say this, this is where I'd like to spend a lot of time. He could taste it. If God has said that this land is ours, then I'm part of the people who shall inhabit this land because he is faithful to his word. And as he is going spying out the land, his fellow spies are chirping around like silly grasshoppers, terrified out of their wits. He's going around saying, now where would be the best place to live? And he finds the headquarters of Anak, those giant kind of people. And it's in an area called Hebron. He says, you know, this seems to be the best place. And the fact that these guys chose it as their headquarters is a good reason. He said, I'm going to live here when we take the land because the Lord will give it to us. That's an incredible statement. He picked out the exact location of his house and he could feel it. He could smell it. He had the image in his heart. And so when they came back, the others are coming back like grasshoppers. He walks in 
like a warrior bigger than the giants, though he still was only about five foot plus. But he had the land, and specifically that part that he'd chosen was his. It was already in his spirit. It's as if he carried a photograph inside of him. He saw that overcoming the giants, of course that would happen, the Lord was with him. And so he asked Moses, and hear me carefully, for what he realized was already his. If the Lord had said Canaan is yours, even though presently you're outside of it, but the Lord had said it's, it's yours, then he said, then I will ask Moses for what is already mine, even though we're not there yet. And he asked for that area called Hebron, and, and Moses gave it to him. They wept all night, if you remember, while Moses, uh, Moses and Caleb plead with them for sense. The next morning we hear of Joshua. It seemed it took Joshua all night to decide whether he would stand with Caleb or the others, the other ten. That's not a put down on Joshua. I like the honesty of that. He, had, he, he was not quite so bold as Caleb. It took him all night to come to commitment. And, and he did. And the next morning he stood with, with Caleb. Of course, they didn't go in. They turned around and they wandered in the wilderness for 40 more years, winding round in circles because they'd refused to go in trusting in the faithfulness of their God and His promises. Forty years later, it's a new generation for everyone who said they wouldn't go in. They're dead now, except for Caleb and Joshua. And Joshua leads the people into Canaan. But an interesting thing, you know, Joshua said, we'd better spy out the land. I mean, you can't go in blind because they were coming around on the other side, not, not Kadesh. They were coming in across the Jordan these 40 years later. And Joshua wasn't about to send 12 in. You never know what 12 might come back saying. He sent two in. So two spies go into Canaan and they go into the house of Rahab in Jericho. Do you remember that? This was a Canaanite city. It's one of those that they were terrified of 40 years ago. It was a city that made them say, we're grasshoppers. And they'd taken one look at this city and hopped away, terrified out of their wits. Now, 40 years later, Israel comes around and the two spies go into Jericho and they stay with Rahab. It's fascinating. Boy, I wish we had another half an hour left. You know, she said, Rahab, who is one of those ites, you know, the Amorites, the Jebusites, the Hebrews, well, she was one of them. But she said to them, you know, I know who you are. I know who you are. Uh, we've been talking about you for 40 years, you know. You see, we know this is we know what happened in Egypt that was 40 plus years ago the plagues of Egypt she said oh no we know we know we know what happened at the Red Sea everybody talked about it they haven't stopped talking about it since we know how you went through the wilderness and God provided and kept you we know and our hearts melted within us. We were scared spitless of you. We were terrified of you because we recognized that the God who delivered you from Egypt, who brought you through the Red Sea, who kept you in the wilderness, he, if he gave you this land, we might as well put up our hands and say, take it. But you went away, didn't you? <laughs> Forty years, but you're back, and
and our hearts are melted with fear for we know that the Lord will give you the land. Isn't that incredible? They are hopping back to their camp saying that they're grasshoppers and the people they're running away from see them as the very presence of a God that is bigger than them all. The powers of darkness know who we are even if we don't. Isn't that amazing? Did you hear me? Their enemies that they fled from because they felt they were grasshoppers, their enemies saw them as mighty warriors with all the presence of God radiating from them. And they were ready to surrender, but they hopped away. Amazing. And of course Israel came into the land under Joshua and it took about five years before they had taken the land. And on Caleb's 85th birthday, his 85th birthday, you can read all about it in Joshua chapter 14. He said, today I am 85. And he said, way back, way back, when you and I, Joshua, we were spies in this land and he said I laid claim to Hebron and I went to Moses and I said I'm asking for what is mine for the Lord has given us the land so I laid claim to Hebron the Moses said you shall have it so he said on my 85th birthday I'm more ready than ever to take it and I have come to you to ask permission to go and take what is mine. And he did. And Caleb and all his clan lived in Hebron for years and years. He kept that commitment to God's word in his heart for 40 years. While all those who said no... Yeah, he had to go along with it. He lived through their desert wanderings, but he never stopped saying, that's mine, and that's where I live. And he did. You and I are facing days, increasingly so, where going forward looks like impossible. But I am saying to you this night, that every promise that he has made to us, covenant promises sealed with the covenant blood of Jesus, they are yes and they are amen in and through Jesus Christ. Look at those promises. See them as looking in a mirror what they say about him and what they say about you and lay claim to them for they are the absolute final truth and know them as yours and when you pray you are asking for what is yours you're laying claim to your Hebron and do what Psalm 103 says forget not all his benefits look back at the milestones that love has planted in your life I call upon you to do it tonight and maybe through tomorrow and tomorrow night. Go back and see every time that he's been faithful to protect you, faithful in provision. Forget not all his benefits. Because unless you let those benefits, those blessings, those incomings of love, let them heal you from experiences of the past let them be the arms of love around you to assure you that he who was with you is with you and remember his finished work remember his mighty resurrection from the dead remember that he alone has authority in heaven and earth Remember that he has given to you his Holy Spirit and lay claim to what is yours. When you know who you are, then you can rise up and face the impossible and realize that inside that impossible is yet another 
benefit, another blessing, another revelation of the love which he has toward you. Well, tonight I could have done with another half an hour, at least, maybe another hour, but um, we, we don't have it. And so I trust that this that I have shared is a blessing to you. In, in many respects, I, I feel at 73, I, I've been initiated into a certain company. I'm, I'm the youngest one in the company. Um, you know, Moses did not go to deliver Egypt until he was 80. Caleb didn't come into his own that he'd waited for all his life till he was 85. The Lord called Abraham when he was 75 and his little wife was 65. He didn't have Isaac until he was 100 and she was 90. Uh, I could keep going. Um, as I say, I'm a, I'm a youngster in that company, but in the scripture, um, I, I, I can relate to these people. Um, when I was younger, they seemed awfully old. Um, now I'm breathing down their neck and, and realizing that for me, I'm being self-indulgent here, but I, I recognize that maybe now is when we begin. Now, those promises that the Lord gave to me as a teenager and in my 20s, now we shall see them come to full fruition. Anyway, couldn't resist just throwing that in. Anyway, um, we're going to um, come here. Yes, we're enabled. Um, and could I underscore, let's keep our questions and our sharing at least more or less to what we're talking about either last week or this week. Um, that keeps it right on the, um, the subject. And so, do we have? Okay. Um, yeah, in Proverbs 3, Cindy, we lean not on our own understanding, always um, on the Lord, because He is faithful to what He's done. Uh, th those verses in Proverbs are tremendous. He says, uh, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. Um, and as you point out, so often, if not every time, our own understanding is the opposite uh, to what the Lord is holding out before us. So that, that, that is so true. Uh, Russ man must know covenant truth and promises. What is our land? The New Testament um, sees the land. <clears throat> I, I, you know, again, we could spend a whole seminar on the land. Um, the land without going into, because once I start on it, we will be here all night. Um, so let me just go bottom line that the land in terms of how the New Testament looked at it is the whole of our inheritance in Christ. Um, it, it is everything that the Holy Spirit would bring to us. Your inheritance, your inheritance is that you should be filled with the Holy Spirit and live in the true relationship with the Father and the Son as your normal life. Your inheritance is that the love of God shed abroad in your heart should flow through your behavior so that all bitterness, anger, unforgiveness has been put away and you now are bearing the fruit for those around you to eat of kindness and gentleness goodness, love in all its expressions. You know, the land, it, it means that 
He has come into our physical, material world with the promise of his blessing. And so he says, healing for your body. He says that he, he take no thought of what you shall put on or what you shall eat or drink. Your father knows. And so as you go to work or if you don't have a job, as you look for a job, you know that he goes before you. He is in you. He is your provider. That's, that's the land. It's the, it's the totality of our inheritance in Christ in our spirit, our mind, our emotions, our body, and everything that we touch. And um, I might say the scripture, New Testament scripture, always says we live in the better covenant. And therefore, if he provided for those that we looked at tonight, how much more in this better covenant does he provide for us? And so I, I hope that... Um, that helps. Okay, I'm just, yeah, in, in a sense, I'm talking of freedom walking. Um, the ways of God are the paths of God. Awesome to know we have a footprint to follow. Yes, that is true. But the maybe greater thing is that he makes his home in us and so we are putting our feet in his footprints not as following so much as he's in us and he's making his footprints in and through our lives um, so we do follow but we follow because we're joined and he makes his footprints in ours um, Okay, how does this tie into the renewing of your mind in day-to-day -day living? Uh, the Israelites, as I said, forgot what they should remember, and they remembered what they should forget. Renewing of the mind is the act of deliberately replacing our memory. Um, replacing all the negatives of our life, all the abuses, all the losses, all that we would count failure, re replacing those with the fact that the God who is love was with us in all of those experiences and brought us to this moment. And to know that He is now the one who in that same society of life is the one who is loving us and is the strength of love within us and, and that takes you don't get that just by hearing me you see you could hear me and still not know the ways of god you it's possible that you could hear what i'm saying and go through life saying wow that was neat that was neat file it away yeah i heard that uh, and, and that would simply be, you, you saw the actions of God. You, you heard the act of God in my lips. It did nothing to you because you, you forgot it. You left it on a Tuesday night and you wrapped it up October the 11th, 2011. I heard that. And there it goes further and further and further and further away. You forgot it. I mean, you might still in our Western language you might remember it but the truth is you've forgotten it because you leave it here on Tuesday night and you do not bring it into your continuing presence and, and do it and, and and so the renewing of the mind is bringing my mind constantly up to date with the one I see in the mirror of reality the mirror of Jesus and therefore I, I I've got to see myself and to see myself for who I am and to see God for who he is I am constantly dropping off all the garbage that has been my experience and my memories to date hope that helps okay um. <laughs> Would you give us the scoop on the promises God made to you when you were 17? Encourage us, please. 
That would take a long time. Maybe I'll take the time to share my testimony with you on that. Um, but just even to begin on that would take us for the rest of the time we allot for this discussion. So I hear you encourage us, please, but it would take a time, and maybe I'll take, I will, maybe I'll take a time just to share my testimony with you. Um, Claude, you have been used for over 35 years to help me experience the love of God. Thank you for sharing that. Just seeing your name on the screen, I would never dream that's true. And, and so that is a great blessing to me. Thank you. Thank you. That's a birthday present to me, just sharing that. Valerie, good to see you again. And thank God. Um, I have had Bible school in the last, this last weekend. We had um, 15 hours in um, Module 5. And um, then, of course, this. So I haven't had the chance to get to your manuscript, but it looks mighty interesting. So I'll be getting there. I'll be getting there. Um, Mark, what am I hearing? What I am hearing is that we need to take God's promise seriously. That's the understatement of a night, Mark. But doesn't the Spirit have to make them a living reality in our hearts instead of just head facts? Yes, but we cooperate in that. You see, it goes back to what I said the other week, that resting in God is not passivity. Um, I, I know sometimes I sound like a broken record on this, but it fits to everything I've said tonight. Why did Paul continually pray for his sheep, his converts? He had these churches around the Mediterranean, and he tells us, I pray without ceasing for you. And what was his prayer? It was, you know it, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, opened. And so, I come to Scripture, and I can, I can read through Scripture, you know those programs, go through the Bible in a year. Well, okay, so you've run the 26-mile marathon. I, I think I've told you before, when I was a child growing up in England, um, we had American tourists, and they came in there buses and anything that in in England if it comes from America looks like the sons of Anak I mean the cars and the trucks and the buses that come from the States are enormous when they're seen in the context of England and the American buses would fill a whole road there was no room for anything else on the road and they would always be going fast and all these tourists would be hanging out of the window. It was a ridiculous sight. And as they're going with all the dust flying from the buses, these tourists were hanging out the window with their cameras, a la 1950s, and they were taking the photographs as they were going by. And then they would stop at a local pub, and they'd all get out, take the photographs, and... Um, that they, they would just sort of walk, we were grasshoppers in their sight, and, and then they'd all be back on the bus within a few minutes, and off they'd go, and I know when they get home, they say, we went here, we went here, we went here, we went, they didn't go anywhere except the inside of the bus, for goodness sake. Okay, people go to the Bible like American tourists in, in buses, uh, and they go zooming through, you know, I read my five verses, I, I read through this, Stop. I, I, I have taken sometimes a whole year to meditate on one psalm um, and continually pray through every verse that the Holy Spirit will open my eyes and not only open my eyes, make it real to me and not only make it real to me, but enable me to join in with that living covenant word. And um, that's how, so yeah, I mean, absolutely, I agree with you. The Spirit 
has to make them a living reality. And if you are reading scripture and you cannot lay hold of it as Caleb laid hold of Hebron and say, this is mine. See, that might take you six months to get there. We talked about it last week. I think it was Claude who brought up that I hadn't said little steps, which I should have done. Um, yeah, it, it might take you six months to say, in, in that sense, read through John or Ephesians or Philippians or the Psalms or whatever um, and pray that into you and recognize this is mine and I might not actually be living there yet but it's mine and therefore I am asking the Father in the name of Jesus who made this mine that it become mine and the Holy Spirit, that's his goal too, to make it mine. And I cooperate, I work out my salvation with fear and trembling, knowing it is God, the Holy Spirit, who works in me to will and to do of his good pleasure. So, um, yes, absolutely. And I'm going to thank you too for bringing that up, Mark, because um, it would have been a sad night if we didn't realize that. Um, and so... That, that, that is good. Okay. Um, uh, uh, oh dear. I, um, there's a lot of you on tonight. And I'm trying to try this. Yeah. There is another scripture in Isaiah that relates that God sees us as grasshoppers. Yeah, and I'm very happy with that. Um, it's, it's when I think of myself as a grasshopper in the face of the domain of darkness. When I look at Satan and feel like a grasshopper, that's bad news. Terrible news. Tragic news. But when I look at God and I see him limitless, I, I can't think limitless. I cannot think that with God all things are possible. I mean, it's easy to say, but I can't think it. That's got to seep into every part of my atomic structure and the, in my spirit that with God all things are possible. That's so vast to me. All, 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 all things, things are now possible with God. No word of God is void of power. I feel very small before that. To, to think that the Creator, couldn't you think Creator? I can't and talk about it, but to think Creator. I, I take up a piece of grass and to know that this piece of grass existed in the mind of God and was spoken by the Son, Jesus, the Creator. And, and, and He is the one that spoke the atomic structure of a piece of grass. Can't think of it. It's too big. I mean, I've reported to you the parting of the Red Sea, but to simply think that, and I feel then like a grasshopper before God. And that's great because that means I worship, I stand in awe, I stand in wonder. So it depends why you feel like a grasshopper. If it's before any thing or any person or any event that stops you from inheriting your land of promise, your inheritance in Christ and you feel like a grasshopper before your enemies that is wrong and what I said tonight is the word of the Lord to you but if you look at the greatness of God and the limitlessness of his love and the magnificence of his goodness and the wonder of his works and you feel small and you 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 stand in awe that he has exalted me in Christ and calls me child and beloved. 
Yeah, I feel like a grasshopper, but I'm a grasshopper with a crown on. I'm a grasshopper in Christ from that perspective. Okay? Um, I hope that helps. Okay, in his care. Thank you for your greeting. Um, finding strength, change your thinking. Yeah. I purchased them a month ago, encourage everyone to do the same thing. Amen. I, you see, I, I never listen to my tapes or my CDs, nor do I read my books. Um, I guess I abandoned my children upon birth, but um, thank you for telling us that. And um, I have received many testimonies that, that speak of that. And um, also, you, you mentioned Isaiah 26.3, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind, or the Hebrew word is imagination, stayed upon him. And we've got a number, two series around that thought, uh, living in the peace of God or something like that. And um, they have been a blessing to many people. Okay. Um, it makes so much sense, says Sincere. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials. You're going through healing the long way for a purpose. Yes, you got it. You got it. You see, that, that was the point. I, I pondered that, you know, for ages. Because I, I came upon these ancient maps. I, I, I do things like that. I got the, the maps of Egypt uh, around 3000 BC. And there it is, as you come out of Goshen, where the children of Israel lived, there's a road, it goes right along the top, right along the Mediterranean, and there you are, you just turn left, and you're facing Canaan, you're there. Instead, they came out of Goshen, and they turn right, into the wilderness, into the sand dunes of lostness, and then wandering around in there, giving time for Pharaoh to get his senses together to come after them, and then leads them smack into the Red Sea. And I said, why? If they had done that by themselves, then yeah, they got lost. But the cloud led them, God led them that long way. Why did God lead them into the wilderness of the Red Sea and had Pharaoh again breathe down their neck? Why? Well, after a while, it dawned on me, of course, it, it was a, a journey of healing, journey of healing. And um, that's exactly what happened. They, they had to face the Red Sea. They had to feel their absolute helplessness and the impossibility of the situation so they might discover the love of God which is healing love to their past and so thank you for saying that sincere it makes so much sense it does so we do count it all joy when we fall into various trials by the grace of God you're going through healing the long way for a purpose so you can receive more the real substance yes write that in gold and plate it in silver that is the truth thank you sincere um, yeah, that's a good thought, Lexi. We stand before God as grasshoppers, but we stand before men as giants. And that's, that's good. That's good. Okay. Um, okay. We're coming to an end here. I do want to get home for my birthday tonight. Um, thank you, Susie. Made the difference. And his blessings do continue upon us. Okay. And, um, yeah, do I... June and Letitia. Unbelievable. Bless you, lady, and bless Letitia. Uh, if any of you wonder what I'm talking about. Um, June and Letitia came to my meetings back in the 70s and the 80s, haven't seen them in ages. Bless you, bless you. 
Well, I'm glad I got down this far before we have to say good night. The time has come. It has been a joy to be with you. Um, I didn't plan having my birthday night with you, but it's a joy to me that I did. And thank you again for your greetings. Um, I, I feel honored by them. And we shall be back again next week. And um, what is it? Um, we'll be back again next Tuesday and the following Thursday. So back next Tuesday and then Wednesday, Thursday, we begin a new module one and then the new cycle of modules that follow from it. So if any of you have thought about it and had forgotten that's when it begins, it will begin then. And of course also our winter retreat the first weekend of December here at the ranch. The meetings will be here at the ranch and um, we offer that free of charge just for your love offering and donation. We'll be talking on the very source of the Christian life uh, and that will be an exciting time. So look forward to seeing you next week and now the blessing of God who is almighty love, limitless love, unconditional love, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. His blessing be with you and rest upon you and grant you his peace that passes all human comprehension this night, this week, and to the ages of ages. So I bless you, and so it is. Amen. Amen.